the only way that which my work would be, I guess, be seen as postmodern would be to the extent that I am simply part of my time. I actually do not view myself as an eccentric or outside of my own time because I think that would be sort of a weird position to take because there's so many people who are doing, you know, work that Is uses that different time? narrative structures and that uses figuration, it uses idiosyncratic personal information. The irony that does appear in my work is more a personal irony. It's not an irony about art making. And I think that is part of the nature of postmodern is to question mm -hmm. some of the basic structures by which we make art. And I don't think I actually do that. What is your relationship as an artist to both theater and literature? They're both fields that I'm very involved in, that I really love. I arguably, when I, when I went to CalArts, one of the things that was said to me by one of the post-studio artists that sunk in the most was Jerry Ferguson said to me that, um, given the kind of work I was doing, I should read as much as I should spend time in the studio. And that, I think, is very perceptive. I, I, my work is very informed by my reading. Um, but I think that in my art, I am allowed to do stuff in terms of literary, in terms of my response to literature and my response to theater that I would not be able to do by being directly involved in those fields. So for instance, I don't really want to design theater sets. That's come up a couple of times where people have said, wouldn't you be interested in doing theater sets? Mm -hmm. And I'm not really interested in that. I'm interested in taking all my interest in theater and channeling it into the paintings. And then the paintings become an air sats theater company in which I'm staging my own spectacles. Um, in the same way, I'm not really interested in writing my own poems or my own stories, but I'm interested in channeling all that into the work. I think a lot, there are a lot of things like that in the work where there are things that I don't act out in my life that are acted out in, in the work in one form or another. The paintings are kind of maps of my imagination, of my experience, of my responses to what is happening to me or what is going on in the culture. And the pictures are kinds of diagrams of that, in a, in a sense. The narratives are so beautifully complex and mind-blowing. Mm -hmm. Are the morals of the story as complex and mind-blowing? Oh, there's no moral. <laughs> this is, this okay. is a universe without morals. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> no, there's, no, there's no, there's no point to the stories. In fact, that's... That's brilliant. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> but on the other hand, if one of my students had told me that when I was uh -huh. teaching, I would, no, 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 we're not accepting this. <laughs> no. I, you know, when Scheherazade is telling her stories... Yeah, to tell us about that piece. The, the, the middle-aged Scheherazade? Yes. Well, well, Scheheraz well, Scheherazade is, you know, this figure in The Thousand and One Nights. She is telling stories to keep herself alive. The Sultan has been killing his wife, he's been marrying a different woman every night and killing her in the morning. And so Scheherazade marries him and she starts telling the Sultan a story the first night and the story ends just as the sun comes up. And she says as the sun comes up, you know, but what is this compared to what I will tell you tomorrow if I am still alive? Which I think is like the mm -hmm. single most heartbreaking line in all of literature to me. Mm -hmm. I just love that line. In fact, in the, in the, in the print I'm doing with Ed Hamilton, the penis of the figure is going to say that line. <laughs> what is this compared to what I'm going to tell you tomorrow night if I'm still alive? <laughs> um, anyway, and so, so she tells stories endlessly. And Scheherazade's stories that she tells do not have a point. There are, there are stories in The Thousand Whites that illustrate different ideas about Islam or something, but actually the point of the stories is just simply the, this endless roll of the story coming out, this ocean of, of story that's happening. And there is no point to the stories. The only point you could make is that Scheherazade keeps herself alive by making art. She keeps herself <laughs> alive by telling stories. I would feel the same way about my paintings. There's no point to my paintings, really. I really don't think that they illustrate any one idea about being gay or gender issues or being middle-aged or you know being an artist or anything but I think there is a point to the idea of making art and just being a lot being kept alive that it by creates meaning yeah I think I think meaning is like a snowball you sort of roll it down the hill and it gathers things onto itself you know it's sort of and I think the paintings work that way they kind of gather meaning as they go along they they uh, they accumulate meaning um, there are many 
there are many sets of meanings that lodge themselves into those images and many sorts of questions that they bring up, but there is no one point or one, you know. And I can, and I, you know, at the end of a painting, I can certainly go through a picture and I can find things that I'm interested in that I can think about, well, this sort of illustrates this to me or this really is about this. But the life of the painting in the world is not going to be about me being standing there going, this means this and this means this. The life of the painting in the world is going to be about other people being engaged with those images and being able to construct their own meanings out of them. And that, I think, is where the paint, that's where a work of art becomes interesting, where it is alive enough that you can bring to it all of your stuff and start constructing meanings out of how you interact with that work of art. Mm, so beautiful. that interests me a lot more than than having my own meanings necessarily. There's several different things that will dictate how the things mm. are described in the paintings. Sometimes it is that I want something to have a kind of meaning that's given to it by being rendered in a certain way, either being rendered very carefully or being rendered very roughly. Um, oftentimes there's things in paintings where I simply want to do something to throw myself off course, that I want to try and do something that I won't know how it's going to work and I don't know what it looks like and and there's a lot, of, a lot of the kind of ways that things are made in the pictures have been invented because I couldn't figure out how to make something work. And so I would just be frantically at a certain point trying to make anything work in the picture and I would come up with some other way to make the image. That really interests me. I mean, that, I mean it's disconcerting when it's going on and I don't always like it when it's going on, but it's, but it's much more interesting in the long run for the painting, I think. I love, I mean, as you can tell from the drawings that are up, I, I love a certain kind of description and I love a certain kind of use of technique. I don't think, though, that that is the point of my work and I'm very mistrustful of how that technique can start to become reassuring and a kind of a warm bath that you lower yourself into or you just feel really comfortable. And the viewer, for that matter, feels really comfortable because they're being reassured. That doesn't interest me so much. Mm. So I want to have that be one, as it were, one visual syntax among many visual syntax that are happening all at once. And that's true also in a lot of the, the painting that I like, in, in some of the Indian painting that I admire. There'll be a way in which something will be really beautifully described at one point, and then there'll be a very abstracted building right next to it. Um, in, in a lot of the theaters that I can think of, um, in the Japanese and the Indian theaters, they'll use that where something is incredibly beautifully described or incredibly naturalistic and it is juxtaposed with sort of amazing abstractions in terms of mm. how space or action or figures work. And that really, I think that seems very fertile. It's very, very fertile ground in which the sort of meanings I'm interested in can grow up. There's been this sort of structure that has been in the work, in the paintings in the last several years, which I, as a shorthand, I will call, I call heaven where there'll be a part of the painting where something happens at the top of the picture. Mm -hmm. It's not really heaven though. It's just kind of another layer of reality that happens in the picture and it gives me a chance to somehow build a picture where there's a narrative that's more complex. There's something happening here but something happening here and do they rhyme together? Do they contradict each other? Are they pulled together or pulled apart? And they are really not about, they're not about heaven and they're really not about rebirth because I think that day-to-day -day life is so complex in terms of how we actually perceive things and the structures that we perceive them through that I don't think I really the way one could represent that I, I don't know I, I don't I don't want to add on the additional layer of another world another life mm. um, a rebirth um, I think that it's so interesting and so complex to try and describe what it's like to be alive in this world that it that everything else would just be conjecture and that doesn't interest me a whole lot. Mm -hmm. All that said, my partner is a rabbi, so we have yeah. many interesting discussions about this <laughs> issue. <laughs> you make, I don't know, between two to three paintings a year, is that accurate? Well, we, we, were, we were talking about this before <laughs> the day started rolling. I, the, the working process is such that it's hard to pin it down. A, the last large picture I did took a year and a half, which I hope is not going to set a new new record for me, or a new, new trend with me, rather. Um, 
I will paint for a while and then I'll draw for a while usually. So maybe there'll be two years and I'll produce two to three to four paintings and mm -hmm. then I'll draw for a period of several months or a year and produce a batch of, you know, 10 to 20 drawings. Um, and it kind of sort of rolls back and forth. Well, given the demands and particularities of the work, yeah. has the output benefited you as an artist or has it been a drawback or both? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, it's... Um, <laughs> this is Bella. <laughs> um, I, th I think that um, several years ago when I was trying to find a gallery in New York, uh -huh. my friend Larry Pittman sat me down and he said, I don't know how you're going to do it. But you really have to realize that in order to achieve a certain level of success in the art world, you have to be able to do a show a year. You have to be able to do, because you have, because if you're going to have two dealers, to say nothing of getting to the point of having three or four dealers, sure. you have to make sure that they can have a show every two years in order to keep them more or less happy and more or less engaged with the work. So it's a condition I, of the market, or well, I, well I, I thought about it for a long time, and I finally came back to him like a year later, and I said, you know, I really have thought about it. And I, I, on the one hand, I think you're right. I think that's true, but I also have realized I can't do that. So I have some other path ahead of me. It's not the path that you were describing, and it means that there will be, you know, the kinds of success that I will try for are probably not that kind of success. In other words, I'll probably never earn my living from my work because I work too slowly. Yeah, I don't but... want, when I go into the studio, my feeling is, when I go into the studio, the pleasures I get from being in the studio and the pleasures I get from the interaction I have with my work and the work of others is so intense and it's so particular. And I can't conceive of anything in my life that's like that. And so I can't think that it's worth selling that for any amount of money as it were. Absolutely. So when I go into the studio, I you know, I've been very fortunate. I have sold my work and my work, you know, and I do work with dealers. But I don't want my decisions in the studio to be how fast can I get this painting done so that I can, you know, have a show of ten paintings this year. Yeah. Because the way that I think is not like that and the way that the structures and the work operate are not like that. So, on the one hand, many of, you know, some of the dealers I've worked with have pointed out how, you know, great this is because, you know, I can control demand for my work. There's, <laughs> there's very little work coming out of the studio, and there's always somebody who wants something, <laughs> so, yeah. so that's great. On the other hand, you can't, you know, I, as I said, I'll probably always work at other jobs to finance my work. And um, and that's that's fine. That's not a I don't know. It's it's frustrating sometimes, but it's not a bad thing. You know, it's not bad for artists to be engaged with the world. Can you talk about the differences that occur between the drawing work and the paintings? When I make paintings, what I get to make and and, and you know it's interesting because I've always had some people who say to me, "Oh, we really like the drawings. You should do more drawings." And other people who say, "We really like the paintings. You should do more paintings." They they each satisfy different things for me. When I make the paintings, I can orchestrate these spectacles, these sort of enormous, complicated narratives and all these ideas and all this, all this syntax all at once. And that's really tremendously engaging and fulfilling. Um, when I do the drawings, what they're really about is taking one thing and bringing it up as close as I can get it to me and, and really looking at that usually. I've done some drawings where I try and do a drawing that is more like the paintings, and I, they're not that interesting to me, where there's a picture, where there's a drawing, and there's many things happening, sure. and there's some ink drawings I did in the 80s that I liked that were like that, but not, for the most part, the drawings are about intimacy, monumentality, singularity, um, a more quiet and a more careful experience with, with what you're looking at. Uh -huh. And the paintings are more about splashiness and promiscuity and, you know, diversity and sort of making something that has got so much going on that you, you don't even know what you're looking at at first quite. 
Whereas the drawings, I don't think you really can say that. The drawings are pretty clear, usually, what you're looking at. There is a kind of intense pleasure about just sitting there trying to describe something that I really love. Mm. And that's in the drawings are where that really gets to flourish in some way. You know, So I can just sit there and say, the only job I have is to make this goat look as present as I can get it to look. So that's my job, just make the goat there. And that's very different from the paintings where there's like a million things happening. The main rule is no boredom in the studio. No boredom. Yes. There can be despair. <laughs> but no boredom. <laughs> You've been aptly described as a virtuoso talent. Do you believe that talent is innate or learned or no, both? I don't believe in talent. You don't believe in talent? Um, one of the one of the most powerful things I remember at Cal Arts that I just that really sunk in, I really loved, was Elizabeth Murray was teaching there when I was there, my last year of grad oh, school. Yeah. And she was the first artist who I knew where I really became engaged with her work as abstract work. That it was when she was doing the very early work, so there'd be like an enormous panel with, say, just a field of magenta and then like a loop across it mm. in a tiny square. And she was the first artist where I really found myself engaged with what those pictures were about and how the thought process worked, who was, who was working abstractly. And and also, she was a tremendous example because she just worked so hard. Every time I'd go to see Elizabeth, she was in her studio working. She was not interested in social life or being, you know, a glamorous teacher or anything. She wanted to just work. And she did a talk about her work at one point, and she showed slides of her early work. And there was an early painting that's based on Whistler's mother, where there's sort of this cartoony figure falling out of a rocking chair, and it's repeated in rows over <laughs> and over again. And she talked about how she couldn't draw. And then she realized that she couldn't draw very early on, that she was, not, she was not a good draftsman, she was not graceful, she did not have talent, she did not have technique, but that she wanted to make pictures and she just worked really hard and hmm. thought about what those pictures were and responded to what she was making and worked hard. And I, that made a huge impact on me because I thought, you know, there's a million people running around Art Center in the Illustrator program who have talent. I see. But they don't make interesting pictures to me. Right. Um, and talent, I think the thing that really sunk in about Elizabeth's example was that talent, talent, you know, is, is, is half a tank of gas, but discipline is a whole tank of gas, you know? <laughs> and, Absolutely. And the whole point is to go, like, as far as, you know, to go the whole distance through your life with this. And discipline, right. discipline and really thinking about your work serve you a lot more than kind of facility do. Facility's fine, but it's not really gonna solve the, the situation. One of your friends told me I should ask you to tell a joke. <laughs> do you know any good jokes? <laughs> <laughs> Who asked you that? Carol. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, my favorite joke that comes to mind is one that probably would be extremely offensive, to them, but it's not racially offensive or you know anything like that. Yeah. Um, there are six men at a cocktail party, and they're all discussing how intelligent they are. They're doing what's called weenie wagging, and so the first man <laughs> says that he is. Um, <laughs> that, um, says I have an IQ of. Um, 240. And um, wow. somebody else says, I have an IQ of 220. And so they begin discussing um, Barth and semiotics and <laughs> philology, and they go off on their own. So there are two people, four people left, and one of the men says, well, I have an IQ of 170. And the other guy says, well, I have an IQ of 160. And they begin discussing um, Bush and Bush's travels overseas <laughs> and the economy and they go off on their own. So the two people, two men left. 20 minutes go by without either of them saying anything. Finally, <laughs> one of them says, I have an IQ of 60 and the other one says, I have an IQ of 40. What do you use, oils or acrylics? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's brilliant. <laughs> I was hissed once at a party for telling that joke. <laughs>